Hello, and welcome to the Low Carb Conversations podcast. Today, I am joined with Amy Russell. She is a holistic health coach, and she coaches over with our friend Jonathan at the Keto Road. You can find her on Instagram as the Keto Advantage. And Amy has been successfully living a ketogenic lifestyle. She's lost a ton of weight. I'll let you, I'll let her tell your story, her story, but she has just been like a real beacon of hope and inspiration online. And I wanted to have her on the show today because she has such a powerful story. Welcome to the show, Amy. Hello. Hello, Holly Jean. Thanks for the invitation to come and join me today. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to hearing a lot of your insights because I feel like there's a lot of coaches on the internet or just in life who maybe really know their stuff and are great coaches, but not a lot of coaches have actually like done the journey or walked the, walked the walk themselves. And um, I think you have like such powerful things to share. And so why don't we start a little bit by, um, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners and, and your story so they can become familiar with you? Sure, sure. Um, so again, Amy, you can find me on Instagram. I'm on Facebook too. My, I, I think of my, my journey in, in big layers. So I have kind of a hard part of, of what was going on with my body and my thinking. And then I've had this section that I call my healing story. And I think it's, for many of us, we have things that aren't working. And for me, I came from a 19 year career, which I loved. And, but I left that 19 year career just broken. I, it was hard. And I, I left tired, like to my core tired. And to the point where like, I couldn't even read. I I couldn't read a sentence. I was, couldn't focus on things. And that was a moment of, I needed rest. I needed to heal that part of me that was, was tired, couldn't collaborate, couldn't create. So um, the first part of my healing story was just rest. And um, then the layers started to heal. So the first was just being creative again. I mean, that sounds like such a strange place to start your healing story and a health journey, which is about losing 200 pounds. But for me, it started with finding that joy again of creating. And I learned to quilt and I learned to quilt by watching videos. It was such a strange thing. Um, So that's where it started. And then from there, I kind of figured out I could learn by watching videos about quilting because remember, I wasn't reading. So I came across a doctor who was talking about diabetes. I knew there was something wrong going on with my body. Uh, And I knew I had so many symptoms of type two diabetes, but I was too scared to go to the doctor because as a, a, a large person, an overweight person, all of my life, the doctor always felt like a shaming place to me. So it didn't go. So I started watching YouTube videos one after the other about about keto and low carb and insulin resistance and glucose. And um, then I decided, okay, I'm going all in. And in 2018, just said, okay, let's, I'm doing this. And I, first thing I did, I cleaned out the kitchen. Things went, cupboards were cleaned out. And I actually had to do that twice because after the first round, I realized, oh, you, you don't really know exactly what you need to clean out. And I repurchased things and thought, uh oh, I found out some of the things you repurchased weren't, weren't very good either. So uh, with that year, uh, applying what I had learned, I lost over a hundred pounds that first year. And then I knew I had a long journey. And so I was watching another YouTube video and wa- watched uh, Jonathan Shane, the keto road. And he was talking to another influencer and I knew, I I probably need help. I have a long way to go and I don't want to lose hope. I don't want to lose the momentum. It was probably, it was the first time in my life that any kind of diet change, like made its way to a lifestyle change. And I, and I call it that it's, this isn't just a diet for me. So I hired him and that's really when the healing of thinking about coping strategies and emotions and eating disorder. I started that healing process. So here, there's another layer. 
and then um, a year ago, well, and then along that, um, lost I've lost about two hundred pounds. But to me, that's only one. That's one part of what was healed. That's only one part. The other things about my relationship with food and thinking about what my body needs rather than external. What does your body need? What does this body need? Has been part of that story for me. Um, and then a year ago, I started coaching and helping other women. And that it's it's an honor. It, it true. It is an honor to be able to walk alongside someone who is on that journey. It really is. Well, I, I think you're absolutely fantastic. Your story is so inspiring. And I like how you talk about the layers and, um, your part where you, where you just started and you're, you're stepping out of that career and just exhausted and you call it, you said you needed that period of rest. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that period of rest is probably what allowed your body to come out of like fight or flight to relax and give you that opportunity to like find joy again or to find purpose and to like reflect on yourself and realize okay I need to make some changes and I don't want to put words in your mouth but as you are telling the story like that's how I was seeing it I was just seeing like your body relaxing and being able to just find joy you know because it's it's hard to start from that place when you're like stressed out and exhausted oh Absolutely. Absolutely. I did not realize just, I knew there were going to be things that my body was going to change after I, I left um, that particular career. But here's, here's a very clear sign to me of how much my body changed just within two weeks. I, after I, I left, I, I rented a cabin in the woods, literally. <laughs> Sound like the start of a horror movie. I know. <laughs> um, and so I, I just, I would just want to be alone. I just want quiet and I, I, I just want to decompress. And uh, the first week it was by myself. And the second week, my best friend came down with her kids and we just, I just rested. Frankly, she was a gift because she just let me sleep. I, I was no fun. <laughs> I just slept, but within those first two weeks, my body just let go of so much fluid. So much. I I was like all the time in the bathroom. I was all the time sleeping. I realized how dehydrated I was. I, it, it was amazing to me. I think that was a very first, the very first sign of, oh, you have a lot of work to do because this just in two weeks is different. Yeah. That's such a perfect visual representation of that first layer being shed. Yeah. Um, We have an article here that I think fits in perfectly with where we are in this discussion is talking about learn how to embark on your healing journey and welcome the new you. Mm -hmm. I, we come across so many articles on the internet that are just trash, but um, I actually thought this one was pretty good. And uh, I'll give a little summary for our listeners, but it's talking about how we all deserve to go on that healing journey for ourselves and take steps towards healing. But what does that really look like in reality? So this article kind of dives into what those steps are, because whether we're on a journey of just healing something minor, total transformation. Um, It doesn't really matter because we're all coming from different places, whether we're looking to heal trauma, periods of illness, um, the end of a relationship. These are all times when people want to change things in their life Um, after abuse, after burnout, as um, Amy mentioned, um, bereavement. Hey, heck, after a global health crisis, you know, so many people are starting a healing journey right now, but simply maybe just because we just want to change something and be a better version of ourselves. It doesn't have to be some big, huge event in our life that inspires us to want to make changes. It could just be, we're ready to make some changes and that can happen. There's been, um, a recent, um, article or a recent study research study that came out in the personality and social psychology bulletin. And that is exploring how people would like to change themselves in some ways. Um, but just kind of fast forward a little bit. It's so often we see people's transformation pictures, whether it's a before and after a physical picture that we can see, or if we just see have perceived visions of transformation in people, 
oftentimes we don't see all that in between work. We see a before and we see an after, but we don't have a clear picture of what goes on in between the good days, the bad days, the hurdles, the obstacles, the struggles. Um, not to say every journey is full of all those things, but it's not uncommon to hit some roadblocks al along the way. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what a, what a healing journey actually looks like. Um, and it could be so different for everyone. And I know, Amy, you've already shared a little bit of yours. Um, so let's start with maybe what stood out most to you in this article. Mm -hmm. The person who wrote this author used two words that I've actually been using in other places, nice versus kind, nice and kind. And I, I use it in a slightly different way, but I, I locked onto that. So she talked about um, being self-kind and not overly harsh and critical. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her perspective and then I'm going to share with you what I was thinking about. She talked about... Um, that we're human and it's okay to be imperfect, which I totally agree with that. And that's this idea of mindfulness. So what caught me on this one is sometimes, um, sometimes we actually avoid reflectiveness because we're think, we might think we're being critical of one another, of ourselves. There's a difference between harsh criticism of ourselves and being reflective. So this idea of mean, uh, mindfulness is actually part of getting to being reflective and what's working for me and why might it not be working? Because what we have to do is, is so much more than just changing our foods. It's getting into what's happening in our thinking. What are the experiences that we've had that are informing our actions? Because we have a lot of coping strategies that aren't working for yes. us. Yes. Okay, so here's where I'm going to talk about nice versus kind. Nice is surface level. If I'm a boss and I want my, my employees to like me, I am nice. Sometimes I avoid conflict. Kind is I understand what people need and, say, oh, and have the tough conversations. Because sometimes the tough conversations get you to a better place. And that's actually rather kind. So being kind to yourself is mindful. It is not harsh, but is also addressing those deep-rooted needs. Because so good. Yeah, we can't we can't go past those. Yeah, um, that's so true. And sometimes we need to have those kind conversations with ourselves because um, I know, like when we're going through change part of going through change is wanting to establish new habits, right? If we're trying to be a better version of ourselves, then we have to establish new habits that we stick to consistently. And habits are hard to change. They are hard to change, especially if we've had them since we were young, we've had them our whole life. If they are coping mechanisms that we've developed through whatever has gone through our lives. Those things are deeply rooted into our subconscious and those are automatic behaviors. So it's difficult to make those changes. And so it's then we have to be kind to ourselves and ask those smart questions. Like in the moment when we're going, when we're faced with the decision of choosing to do things the way I've always done them, or am I going to make a decision from the mindset of the person that I'm trying to become. And we ought, we tell ourselves these stories that we've developed to keep ourselves safe, you know, and we'll be over like, and over. Wait, oh, and we, and we talk ourselves into decisions. And what, let's say, let's say we're on our healing journey and we've been doing so great. We're like coming up on like the three week mark or something. And we're like, oh, I deserve a reward. I deserve a treat you know, and we tell ourselves, oh, I deserve these things, but it's like, it's in those moments we need to stop. And not that you don't deserve a treat, but it's how are you presenting this to yourself? Are you setting yourself up right now to go back to those old habits because it's what you know, and it's what you deserve? Or are you going to think, do I deserve this right now? Does my, does the person I want to be next week deserve this? Is this how I want to reward myself? it's probably not the greatest example, but I'm just like trying to make that point of, mm -hmm. of asking those questions and like being mindful of the choices that we have in front of us every single day. 
I don't think I, I don't I, think I articulated that. <laughs> I love, I love that because right there, that's like, if I'm coaching, coaching someone and they self-disclose, Oh, I, I, I've, I've been doing really well. I, by the way, I totally had that may same mindset. I've been doing so well. I want to have a treat day. And so here's where mind work comes. I, so it's a language change. It's not that having a food reward is bad, but I think the language changes instead of saying, I deserve a treat. I, I'm going to celebrate. Let's celebrate the success because we are rewriting generation and culture that food is always the reward. So we can celebrate by going out to a movie. We can celebrate by calling up a friend we haven't talked to for a while and say, hey, how are you? Um, I, I want people to celebrate. I actually think it's something we have to do and we have yeah. to recognize the really small steps. But, but um, we are, we are shifting cultural mindsets and those are so deep. And it's that reward, but also uh, if you think about how many functions we have in our family, in church, that there's always food, that that's, that's the language change for me. What, what were some of the hardest things for you to change? Um, So I think sim I'm going to start simple. The simple aspect of um, simple is not simple. Sorry, there's no simple. <laughs> uh, I think the, the initial things like uh, I wanted foods that had crunch. I mean, um, snacky foods, which I was mm -hmm. so used to. And trying to find the replacements for those. Because at that the beginning stages, I wanted the one-to-one -one I'm going to let go of this. I'm going to get the exact same replacement that's healthier for me because I hadn't worked through what does my body really need? I was in a, I want this. I'll, I'll just have a keto fied version. Okay. I, I, you have to move past that, or I think that's a good part to move past, but that was an initial hard chart, hard part. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, really the depth of challenge for me was when I was going through stress, work stress, uh, body stress. So um, deadlines at work and feeling behind, lack of sleep. Those are two things that I know when I'm experiencing those, it's harder for me to um, pause when that initial, I want blank, I want ice cream. Um, and so that, that pause is shorter and then I would go to those foods. So that looked like for me, I'd have the impulse and then I'd come to the kitchen, I'd open the cupboard doors and I'd stand there and then I'd close the cupboard doors and I'd open the cupboard doors. I, so that was really hard for a really long time. And I would say two and a half years of that, that was huge of the impulse and the pause uh, and finding strategies that worked for me, that were healthy to grow that pause because we actually have to grow the pause so we can process and think through that. Um, because if you're coming from a disordered eating, you, you, that might not just vanish for a, quite some time. And the growing of the, the wait time is important. So you can use your, your tools. Um, so that took about two and a half years. And then I think a key for me, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going ahead here. Not sorry, but. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, carry on. I think that impulse was really influenced once I had a what if question. What if some of the cravings I'm having are actually something my body is asking for? So it was a shift in going from a disordered, what was me kind of thinking to, oh, well, what if I, what if there's something I don't know here that's influencing um, disordered eating? And, and that was a huge moment for me when all of a sudden the pause became, okay, what am I missing right now? What's happened? Those what if or those why questions are so powerful mm -hmm. because 
it's easy for us to, when we go, do I really want the ice cream right now? Yes. <laughs> but then it's like, of course, our friends go, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> but if you go, why? What, what is this ice cream symbolizing for me right now? What, what need within my body, within my life, within my circumstances is, is ice, ice cream solving? Mm-hmm. Not that ice cream's like the bad guy, you know, but, but those questions, because it's in those moments where we can say, no, I really am stressed out right now. I am, I am stressed and I am, you posted something on procrastination the other day too. And it's like, I am using ice cream. I'm using whatever this is. I'm using this food substance to avoid having to do what I need to be doing, what I should be doing right now. So those are, that's such a great point. It's like those, those questions that we ask ourselves and being honest with the answers. I think that's an important part of like, man, we, we lie to ourselves so much. And I, I don't think as we're doing it, we realize that we're actually telling ourselves lies, but it, it can be hard. Like these healing, these healing journeys, anyone can go on a diet and lose weight. Um, Anyone can do something for a short period of time and see results and have success. The hard part comes in making those results last and making them sustainable. And you don't get to sustainable results without doing the hard work. Yeah, Uh, totally, totally. Uh, You're making me think of uh, procrastination is really avoidance. And avoidance is often related to emotional regulation, that we're not regulating the emotion of, I am fearful of going forward, or I don't, I, I'm feeling stressed. It's, there's an emotion that we're actually trying to avoid and we're, we're not going into discomfort. We're, we're avoiding discomfort. So something to think about if you're procrastinating. I mean, we do, most of us do it in small ways all the time. Yep. A lot of people procrastinate and you, you meet people all the time who are like self-proclaimed. I'm a procrastinator. I'm just a procrastinator. I work best under pressure. Or I do best under pressure. But as you, as you learn as a coach and as you do things in your own life, we, we also learned that procrastination is a, um, a protective me- mechanism. And oftentimes when we procrastinate, that creates a stress, right? If you're someone who works best under pressure or only gets things done at the last minute because you need that pressure, that could be our subconscious recreating a chaotic home environment when we were children. And it's like procrastination has roots in so many things that we often don't look at. So if you're a procrastinator, you might want to dive into that one a little bit. Uh, for me, just side note, it was avoidance of priorities, avoidance of putting some things above what I thought was noble. Like I thought my career putting, spending 16 hours of a day in my career was noble. Well, that, that may have been seen that way, but it was at a cost. And so priorities was part of that for me. Um, yeah. I, I, two things that you may, you were making me think of, um, the, the mindset behind wanting ice cream of knowing that maybe that's a coping strategy, but there's an, another layer from that's been a learning layer for me. And that has been, sometimes my body is asking for something it needs in regards to hormone health. Mm -hmm. And so if you are going through lots of cravings or you are struggling with staying on something, sometimes we beat ourselves up that, that harsh criticism. And I'm just going to plant the seed that sometimes there's something else going on. And so we go through this blaming and shaming internal, and I I just want to empower the people who are listening. If you're going through something and you keep going through the same, asking the what if question might be really important. Is there something else? Okay. I like this because this is actually a really good transition into our our next topic, but there is one quote in this article that I think kind of sets the stage and it's, There is more than one route to the top of the mountain, and it's very empowering to realize that nobody has the ultimate answers and that those answers come from within. And so this next article is all about like how to listen to your body. 
Um, it's titled, how do you really listen to your body when it comes to food and exercise? Because I think so many people say, oh, just listen to your body. Just listen to your body. And it's like, okay, well, my body's telling me I want ice cream, but it's like, okay, but what's it really saying? So you're, you're saying that there's more to that. And we were talking, um, a little bit before, um, we were like messaging back and forth before we, um, decided to, um, have you on today. And you were talking about how important it is to have flexibility and to ask those questions, those deeper questions, and to not have, I'm seeing it as to not have a prejudged answer. So let's just, because we're a low carb keto show, let's just say you are keto, but you're craving potato chips or you're craving carbs. You're craving more carbs than normal, but you're keeping yourself stuck in, I am keto, I am keto. So let's talk about like the, having the flexibility to listen to your body, to let go of dogma, diet dogma, and to understand that our bodies are going to have different needs at different times and being able to flex and flow with those changes. So what do you have to say about that? Preach it, preach it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I, uh, my first thought is what works at one stage may not work at another. So for some who are, are listening, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak to people who maybe started where I did. I, I started over 450. I was probably closer to 500 pounds, honestly. Uh, when I first started, I, I had other things to heal. I needed to, I needed to address glucose and insulin. I needed to address some mind, mindfulness pieces, but now I'm in a different stage and going into menopause and my body is definitely, um, it has changed the tools that I used fasting. I used fasting, uh, intermittent fasting a lot in the beginning. And it's actually what helped me through the binging cycle because I, I was really structured now. Fasting is stressful on my body. I don't fast anymore. And it, uh, when I do, my glucose is higher. I, I don't sleep well. I have so many things. Women who I'm working with, if they get stuck on just carnivore, then may, and that's all that's, they get stuck on, I can't divert from this. People say it's the most healthy thing for me. It, and if we're not reading our body, we're, we're missing we, we might, we might miss. There are, there are people that carnivore is right at a right time. There are strict keto. There, um, there are all times for those. Um, but boy, do we, we, have to, we have to remain flexible. Otherwise we'll miss and we'll get stuck. Yeah. And you know, I think this is what also makes change so hard for people is because if you don't know how to listen to your body. You can just like blow with the wind of every trend that comes along, every new influencer you see online to just do whatever everyone else is saying. If you don't solidly know how to listen to your body and it's not as woo woo as people think it is. You've already touched on it. It's listening to your bio biofeedback cues, but we've become so out of touch with ourselves. We think it's normal to not sleep well. It's normal to have cravings. It's normal to be moody. It's normal to have no energy. These things are not normal. The, these are the way our body communicates to us. And it this is how normal people are supposed to feel. Normal, healthy people are supposed to be energized. They're supposed to have the energy to get through their day. We're supposed to be clear thinkers. We're supposed to rest well at night and we're supposed to have balanced moods. That is what normal is. Okay. We are not always yeah. um, in homeostasis with all those things. So when when, when something is working for us dietarily and our lifestyle, our routine, when it's working, we feel all those things. When something is off, that is where we need to look at and be like, okay, what needs to change here? These are just levers to pull. And you look at the full picture. I'm not sleeping well. What does my diet look like? Okay. My diet's good, but what else? Oh, look at all this stress I have here in my life. It's looking at those things objectively and being able to know when some levers need to change, when things need to change. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I'm reading a book. I'm part of a book study right now. It's called The Elimination of Hurry. Oh, um, ooh, I like that title. The Elimination of Hurry. It's a faith-based book, but he digs into not only the history of hurry, of speed, and, but also kind of the brain, what's happening in the brain with it. So i uh, just going to plug this book because I'm going to mention it here. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's some reasons why we are not tuned into our body. And so this is part of the reflectiveness uh, about the healing process. Our pace of life uh, is preventing us from having a pause. Yes. A time to reflect. We are not used to being bored. We're not used to having silence. We are, we fill every moment. And, and the, actually this book is actually what made me post the procrastination post, because even when we take a pause, it's often because of procrastination and procrastination doesn't really refill us. We think, we think, we think it does, but it doesn't, it's exhausting because yes. then later we're trying to catch up. So part of, part of our work is we have to reduce the noise, the noise of what's happening around us. That might mean you have to get off social media. You got to stop the flip. That might mean I love it. Um, <laughs> that that might mean that uh, you and the kids just go for a walk and enjoy nature. There's just we we need to build in time with our creator, with our space to listen. And yeah. so that was one. Um, we're also not hearing things because of coping strategies. Uh, that avoidance piece, um, and sometimes part of not hearing like that intuitive piece that becomes really difficult when you don't have a, a, a healthy relationship with food. You don't know uh, when we're not eating foods that actually fill us. So we just keep putting more foods in because no nutrients aren't being absorbed and we want more. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of complexity here, but I think one of the starting places for anyone who's listening is build in time to pause. It's, yes. it's actually, yeah, that's really important. And, um, I don't, I don't know what exact tools you use in your practice, but in mine, this is where I get the most pushback from people when I take on new clients, but it's, um, it's also probably the most impactful and it's doing like a food and mood journal. It's not tracking your food on my fitness pal or um, that carb meter thing. It's not that it's actually pen and paper, writing down what you're eating, how you're feeling at that time, what time it is and doing that for a week and being able to track your moods with what you're eating, whether your mood is influencing your food or your food is influencing your mood because it goes all directions there and actually being able to see it on paper of how your body is responding to things and how you're feeling. And that to me is, if, if you're someone who has no idea like how food makes you feel or where to even start listening to your body, that is something anyone can start right now and today it's one being aware of your food being aware of your mood and just asking those why questions and looking at the black and white pen and paper of what's going on what's been some of the biggest aha moments from people who've done that for you oh gosh um well <laughs> um i would say well, probably because just about every single person i work out work with has blood sugar dysregulation in some way form or another like mm -hmm. that is across the board just about every single person um and so it's making those connections of oh why i need an afternoon coffee it's why does my energy slump after certain foods or oh when i have this for breakfast i'm not needing snacks all the way until lunchtime. So it's like seeing the way their energy responds to what they're eating. Yeah. Because awesome. they, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. so. You'll see that cause and effect early. If we can do that, that helps us along reading our body. I totally see where that could be helpful. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And yep, anyone can do it. You don't need a special tracker. You don't need some fancy form. 
pen and paper. Nice. Uh, all right, Miss Amy, do you have any closing tips or advice for someone who's maybe just starting on their journey? Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the is to have a saying that you have in your head that when things get tough, you just say. And I, I'm going to encourage people to build that in so tightly that it becomes an automatic. So at the beginning, you have to remind yourself, you have to put notes around. For, for me, when I was struggling, my phrase was, my body is healing. I had that post-it note on my desk when the scale wasn't moving, when I, when I was trying to figure out the food piece or what was happening in my head, my body is healing. That changes the focus um, to a surface level, to a more meaningful um, kind place for us. So that's just a tool that I would use for you. And then um, willing to get vulnerable. And that, and that might be with yourself. It might be with someone else uh, to ask for help and um, believe it's possible. Believe it's, I think that would be my third piece that believe it's possible. Sometimes we get to a place where we don't think it, we think we will be this way forever. We will stay in what, what we see the world doing, what we, what we have lived. And, and I'm just going to say it doesn't have to be that way. I believe it's possible. I love it. I love it. Your body is healing. I like it. I love it. Um, Amy, it's been so wonderful to have you on today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, for our listeners, again, you can find Amy on Instagram and Facebook. Sorry, the dog wants breakfast. <laughs> you can find Amy, um, sorry, one second, I'm being distracted here. Um, on Instagram, on Facebook, she is a coach for the Keto Road and you will find her as Keto Advantage on Instagram. And is that also that on Facebook as well? It is. Okay. I will link her up here in the show notes so you can easily find her with a click of the button. And that is the end of today's episode. Our theme music is created by Andrew Bowden and production services are by Kevin Kennedy, Spain of Disco Light Media. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, Holly Jean. <laughs>